Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're tuning in from today. Thanks for joining us for today's web chat with updates for our current day and sorority life community. I'm Argyle Wade, Chief of Staff to Dr. Lori Reeser, our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. I'll be moderating today's panel and sharing your questions with our panelists. Today, we'll be addressing the notice some students in fraternity and sorority life recently received and some of the changes we've made to public health protocols for chapters with live-in facilities that have identified COVID positive cases. As you know, we are taking this issue seriously and we know you are too. This presentation is being recorded, will be available to view here after the town hall is over. Captioning is available in the link listed in the description below the window of the video. You can also share your questions with us throughout this web chat using the link you see on this screen, go.wis.edu slash ask dash us. It's in, the video, it's in the description below the video. Now I'd like to introduce our UW Madison staff speaking with us today. Mark Guthier is the director of the Wisconsin Union and an associate vice chancellor for student affairs. The Office of Fraternity and Story Life headed by director Maggie Hayes reports to Mark. Jake Baggett is the executive director of University Health Services and an associate vice chancellor for student affairs. He's been central to our campus COVID-19 preparedness and our planning efforts. Kristen Reynolds is the Fraternity Story Life Specialist in the Office of Fraternity Story Life. She's direct, directly interacting with Fraternity Story Life students every day on our campus. And Dr. Lori Reeser, who is the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Dr. Reeser, let's stay with you for opening remarks to help set the stage for our discussion today. Thanks, Sargao. Good morning to everybody, and it's really grateful to our students and families for joining us today. We know this is a really difficult time and stressful time for everybody. Um, back in higher education and across our country. We're so excited on a positive note that we just finished our first three days of classes and I can tell you how excited our students are to be back in class. For those who are able to take classes in person, they feel really good about the experience and how things are being set up. And I've also heard lots of good um, feedback and comments from our students and faculty about our virtual classes as well. So. From that perspective, we feel really good about where we're doing, what where we're going, and all the things that we're doing um, to keep our campus safe and productive, and to continue um, with our hybrid model. That being said, um, our COVID counts of positive cases are continuing to rise, and this has been a challenge again everywhere nationally. Um, and, and in this specific for our specific conversation today, really as it relates to fraternities and sororities. We know that a number of, of um, challenges have occurred across the country in fraternities and sororities, from some having large parties um, to just increase um, testing um, positively. So we're really concerned about that. And unfortunately that is happening here in Madison. At the same time, we also know that a lot of our students are doing the right thing. And as, as always, it's just the behavior of a few that are potentially putting all of the rest of us at risk. And so, and, I, and I'm very sensitive to the stigma that's gonna be applied to the fraternities and sororities. When we met with the chapter leaders a couple of weeks ago, I was pretty direct with them and said, you have a target on your back and people are watching you, they're reporting you and they're expecting you not to um, follow these guidelines. And many of them have followed the guidelines and have done the right thing. But we know we've also had some incidents where there have been um, gatherings and, and part of it is just the nature of the houses and the nature of the social interaction that happens between organizations and chapters. So we've had spikes um, and uh, really are grateful for our partnership um, with our public health colleagues in Dane County and Madison. So we've taken some swift actions um, this week and actually they continue even up through today. So our goal today is to be transparent, to answer your questions and concerns, we're really sensitive to knowing how hard this is for families, especially for those of you who are far away and on the coast and probably getting some pretty frantic and difficult um, phone calls and emails and texts from your from your students. So we're here to support you. We're here to um, share as much information as we can um, so that we can all get through this and hopefully continue and have a successful semester. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Reeser. And as I've heard you speak with individuals and groups, we all know that uh, it's difficult to know when you get sick where that comes from. And uh, it's by no fault of anyone's uh, that that happens. We're here to try to give you our best guidance, but we also know that uh, this is something that uh, is a really complex situation. So hopefully from today's 
panel where you can learn some information that will help you be prepared for the next couple of weeks uh, and know what to do so that we can all stay safe. Mark, if you don't mind, can we turn to you to give us a big picture of the Fraternities for Life community uh, and the impact we've seen on COVID-19 there? Maybe you could walk through some of the guidance that we've communicated to the students, parents, and the broader community. Sure, thanks, Argyle. Uh, at UW-Madison, our uh, Fraternity and Story Life community is governed by four independent councils for, with a total membership of approaching 5,000 members in 60 different chapters. Now, we have about 1,500 of those members who are in live-in facilities, uh, and that represents just shy of 40 of those chapters. Um, and we also have seven inactive or unrecognized uh, groups uh, also. Um, since yesterday, we uh, have sent letters to about 520 members from 12 chapters to uh, quarantine in their houses. So let me uh, give you some of the highlights of, of that um, letter that they received. So if they're living in one of the 12 houses that's required to quarantine, the chapter members are ordered by public health to quarantine for a minimum of 14 days uh, immediately upon receiving the letter. And if they're COVID positive, they're actually uh, required to enter isolation. And isolation spaces have uh, been identified and are administered through the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life and have been designated and available for their use. If you're not currently COVID positive, you must be tested for COVID-19 on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at the Fluno Center, September 8th. Schedule appointments now through my UHS and uh, you are allowed to leave your house for this medical appointment. Uh, you're re required to comply with contact tracing efforts and provide timely, accurate information when contacted by University Health Services or Public Health Madison and Dane County staff. And violation of the isolation or quarantine orders may result in a court order for um, involuntary quarantine and a fine of up to $10,000. And also university sanctions could apply. If you've pre previously tested positive for COVID, uh, you, don't, you do not need to quarantine, but you do need to provide proof of that positive test to UHS and your test, positive test must have been within the previous three months. Uh, and if you develop new symptoms, which is possible, you will then be required to, again, quarantine and move into isolation if uh, you receive a second positive test. This is different from the order that, uh, that was in the letter yesterday, yesterday. So we've clarified that uh, in a new letter that went out last night. If you're not among the 12 houses asked to quarantine, the rest of the live-in community and fraternity and sorority life um, is also required to test at this point and must do so at the Fluno Center by the end of next week, by Friday, September 11th. And we encourage the rest of the community to schedule appointments as well through my UHS. If you're COVID positive, you'll be required to enter isolation and uh, uh, comply with all the contract tracing efforts I mentioned previously and failure to comply uh, we'll bring the same um, possible um, actions that I mentioned previously for those that are already in quarantine. So, And uh, just want to also thank those of you who are just joining us and coming online today. I want to remind you the captioning is available in the link listed below the description window uh, under the YouTube video page. So please take a look at that if you need captioning. And that's provided by the McBride Disability Resource Center here on UW-Madison's campus. Jake, let's go to you next. Can you talk about our current case numbers, the kind of thresholds that have factored into this action that we've taken with the Training for Life community, please? Uh, thanks, Argyle. And again, uh, also thank you for joining us this morning and talking about this. Um, so we've been testing really very aggressively on campus, making that testing available to our entire campus community, and including members of the, of the Greek community, and have encouraged people to take full advantage of that. We appreciate that they've been doing that uh, in, in, in very strong numbers. And that's given us the opportunity to really understand where we see areas of concern growing. And that's really what, what has led us to this conversation and some of the decisions that have been made um, uh, in collaboration with the public health department, um, uh, who is also monitoring this. You know, what happens in our community and our campus uh, intersect with each other and very dependent upon each other, as I'm sure you all appreciate. So um, as of uh, this morning, we have over 50 positive cases in the particular chapters that uh, that, that we are addressing. Um, and uh, uh, and those that those numbers are, have been growing and, and, and uh, have caused us to, to think about what are the next steps that should be taken. And and that also has led the public health department to issue the directives that have gone and we're certainly supportive of, of, of that decision. 
Um, and these, and, and because of the growing numbers in this space, you know, it, it, it threatens the health and well-being of not just uh, the members of the of the chapter houses, our students, but our entire community. So we're we're trying to take steps to mitigate that. Um, what's unique about chapter houses is really is the living arrangements. Um, you know, the setting. It's it's considered a congregate living center where there's common spaces that are shared, uh, common dining, and other kinds of places where where the uh, where, where residents would would gather and, and and interact and which is normally a very very worthwhile and valuable experience um but because of that it also creates a situation where the spread can continue uh, uh can, can happen very quickly so according to the cdc um in a congregate living center really one case or more would could could constitute a, an outbreak and something that a, a quarantine order um, would should be considered, and so um, the the health department has been very very carefully watching that along with us, and and that's what's led to the actions that that are going on there. the The goal is, of course, is to get ahead of this and try to mitigate that as quickly as possible. And you know, and we would look at any any congregate living center that has a similar setting in, in a very similar manner. So um, I hope that gives you an idea of what's of what's uh, led to some of the decisions. And again, we're looking at at this as a way to get ahead of this and 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 mitigate any further spread as soon as possible. Thanks, Jake. Uh, we've also had some questions about testing requirements. Uh, some people have received letters uh, that talk about coming in on Tuesday. Some say Friday. Uh, there's a four day wait period. I was hoping maybe you could clarify a little bit of that for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, right, that that probably is not very is confusing to some. Um, so, uh, when you've been exposed, uh, you may not test. Uh, you may not be able to test accurately in the first few days. So, um, uh, so we carefully considered, you know, both when when the order was put into place and when exposure might have most recently occurred to those within the the the, the chapter houses within the community. And Tuesday really actually was the first opportunity that that lined up with what I think are best practices around testing. And so we focused um, uh, and reserved uh, a, a substantial amount of testing capacity so that we can we can go ahead and get those individuals tested as quickly as possible. So that's what that's what drove that time frame. Um, we would we could test earlier, but in fact, folks might develop a positive test result later. That wouldn't have been picked up earlier, and 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 that might have contributed to further spread. So that seemed uh, that it really drove our decision making. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Kristen, thanks for being with us. And you've been working with the Fraternity Story Life members who need isolation space. So maybe if you could speak a little bit about how they can access that space we've designated for isolation. Yeah, of course. Um, so if and when a student tests positive, um, we ask they immediately contact their local housing corporation or chapter advisor. Um, if the student is unable to um, lo relocate home, that um, local housing board and chapter advisor should then call the FSL team or connect with us um, and then follow the protocol that has been um, already sent out to those folks. Um, once that happens, we will collect student information and then reach out to the student about the next steps and how they can access that space. Um, we emphasize that no student should be connecting with FSL staff to access that space. It is really on the local housing board and chapter advisor to connect with the office so we can get a student into that space quickly and efficiently. Um, for whatever reason, a chapter doesn't have um, contacts or a relationship with a local housing board or a chapter advisor currently, we ask that that chapter president reaches out to the office in some way as we wanna make sure that all students get access to the space if they really need it to support their healthy recovery um, from COVID. Thanks, Kristen. So I just wanna let people know we're about 15 minutes uh, into our time together. And I also wanna submit, thank the people who've been submitting questions. We are still taking those. So if you use that link below the screen, the go.wis.edu uh, that you see list, listed there uh, and submit a question, we're gonna to try to address as many questions coming in as we can today. And those we can't get to, uh, we'll make sure to respond via an email. Uh, Mark, let's uh, jump back to you. Maybe you could uh, talk to us a little bit about what chapters have been ordered to quarantine. Uh, sure. So the um, current list includes Alpha Epsilon Phi, Delta Chi, uh, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, Phi Gamma Delta, Alpha Phi, 
theta delta chi, chi psi, alpha chi omega, delta gamma, delta tau delta, and ga gamma phi beta. And we also have three unrecognized groups in this category, sigma alpha mu, uh, theta chi, and alpha epsilon pi. And I know Dr. Reeser has a follow-up uh, for the, uh, based on this list. So. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Just a, just a couple of quick comments on that. Um, one, there is a difference between recognized and unrecognized fraternities and sororities, as you may know. And just to clarify, the chapters that are not recognized by the institution are not able to access the isolation spaces that we have set up um, at the university for, for, for fraternities and sororities. So I want to be clear about that. So for um, chapters who are not recognized by UW, then they um, are on their own to, to determine their own isolation and quarantine spaces. I just want to do a quick shout out to um, Gamma Phi Beta. They were not um, officially on our list as of yesterday. So we had nine chapters, then we added three more. And then we just found out this morning that um, the president of Gamma Phi Beta, when she saw what was happening at uh, the other um, chapters, decided to ask all of her members to get tested on Friday. They did. And unfortunately, she's had positive cases. So at some point, they will um, get these official letters um, this weekend. But it was really that kind of leadership that we're looking for from all of the chapters. I wish we could say that we're probably contained, but the reality is we're probably not. And so we're really encouraging every chapter president, the house corporation, the advisors um, as parents to really think about um, what's in the best interest and knowing that you probably do have positive cases in the chapters. And if they could do that self quarantining right now, then we think that's going to help. And in fact, to even require the testing. The other piece I wanted to mention is we are working really, really closely with our public health department. They are the only ones who are able to put a quarantine on individuals. And so that's what's happening is that the public health department puts the quarantine notification on the individuals. The university can then mandate testing. And so that's what we have done together in partnership. And so again, um, just a quick shout out to Gamma Phi for their leadership. They went ahead and got tested. They're putting their own quarantine on. We will be following up as an institution and, as a, and the public health department to follow up um, from an official perspective, but they're doing the right thing. And that's what we're really looking for all the fraternities and sororities to do if, if possible. All right, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dr. Reeser. Uh, Jake, uh, if you could comment on this, we know that some students uh, prefer to go home or are looking to stay in hotels for isolation or quarantine. Uh, what's public health guidance on that? Um, should they you know, stay where they're at? Can they go home? Is it a violation uh, if they have been mandated to stay in their chapter house? Yeah, thanks, uh, and that's a great question. Um, first of all, the the best practice and the directive is to is to stay in the residence that you're currently in, and that's all about uh, mitigating the spread to other environments. Um, uh, and so, in some cases, uh, individuals might be able to safely travel home, in particular if they're in a, a private vehicle where they're not exposing others to uh, to, to 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 spread. Um, and so, in cases like that, that might be advisable. But really, uh, and, and then if somebody needs to isolate, um, first of all, there's 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 really good plans in place to help support folks in isolation here. Um, it's not a violation of the order to isolate within a hotel, but you won't have the same kind of support that you would in the facilities and the planning that's went, went into place here, or that if you're able to safely travel home and to do that within your home environment. Um, so uh, the, again, the, the directive says to stay in your current residence, that's really the best practice, but it, it, individual decisions um, could be considered, but they have to do that safely. Kristen, do you have any follow-up uh, to that? Uh, is that if uh, members in the court who are quarantined currently choose to um, go back home and complete their quarantine, I think it's important to know, and Jake can follow up to information, if a student in those 14 days test positive, that 14 days restarts over. And so a said member who chose to do their quarantine back at home and are a different residency may be asked to stay out of that chapter facility even longer. Um, and so just remaining in the facility might be the best for that student, um, as they may not know if they're a when or they're able to return back to the chapter facility if they choose to leave for their quarantine period. Great. Thank you for that. 
Mark, how about we jump back to you? What, did, what would the students do for classes? We know this is first on their mind as a student. How do they gonna, How would you suggest they handle this? Well, um, uh, students uh, must um, contact all their faculty members, each one individually, to let them know that they are um, uh, go going to be in quarantine or isolation uh, for at least the next 14 days. Uh, and uh, the faculty uh, this summer were, even those preparing uh, their courses to be in person, um, also needed to be prepared to assist students who might not be able to come to campus, chose not to come to campus, or would fall into a quarantine at some point during the semester. So there should be uh, some pretty robust plans in place for even students that were in in-person classes to be able to switch to an online virtual format for their period of their quarantine or their isolation. But it is the responsibility of the student to contact each individual faculty member to find out what those individual plans are. All right, uh, thanks. We have a lot of questions coming in, so I just want to let you know uh, that uh, we're doing our best to get to all of these questions, but uh, please be patient with us. And again, we will be following up afterwards if we can't get to you today. Uh, Jake, uh, lots of questions are coming about what students can or cannot do um, if they've received a negative test uh, in the past. Can you, uh, and what, how to handle that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. And you know, a negative test in the past is great uh, at that point, but it doesn't necessarily offer you any protection going forward. It simply gives you a, a status at that point in time. So it's not a it's not a reliable thing in terms of making decisions about going forward and changing you know your behavior. So um, uh, so if you if you've tested positive actually in the last three months. Um, and you can provide documentation of that, you, you could be excused from the quarantine requirements. But that's the only exception, and that's based on CDC guidance. Um, again, a negative test today doesn't mean that I won't be exposed tomorrow um, and, and, uh, and, and potentially develop the condition. So that's why we wanted to have everybody tested um, by next week so that we have a, a baseline and can more uh, adequately support those that are in, in a quarantine facility. Jake, uh, can I also ask, does this facility quarantine also apply to the house directors, uh, people who might be working with the house? So anybody that that uh, lives within that facility um, should quarantine. Those that have been exposed to them or considered close contacts would also fall into that category. So individuals will actually be contacted by the public health department uh, and supported either, either by the public health department or the University Health Services working on their behalf. Um, and give specific directions. So if there's a question about that, we can certainly answer that individually, but uh, anybody who's considered a close contact, and that pretty much means anybody within those facilities would be included in that quarantine requirement. All right, and sorry, I'm gonna have to stay with you just for a second. There's so many health-related ones coming in, uh, so hope it'll wear you out. Uh, mm -hmm. How about individuals who have completed their isolation? When can they come back to the house uh, that is quarantined um, and, you know, someone who is in that situation who's looking maybe to come into the house that is quarantined, how would they handle that? So uh, when a house is under quarantine, uh, returning back to the house is, is, is really not advisable until that quarantine period is, has been concluded. Um, somebody who's been in isolation, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and successfully navigated that is considered not to necessarily be a risk to others at that point but the rest of the, the folks in that residence hall will have to, in that facility will have to continue to, to, to quarantine. So if you've, if you've concluded your, your isolation period, that means you've been positive, you've uh, went through the, the progression of the disease and you've been cleared from that, so you can return. But if somebody has been quarantined and leaves the facility, they cannot return to that facility until the entire facility has been cleared from quarantine. Okay, and then one more for you. Uh, the antibody test, uh, the, can they use that to prove that they've already had COVID uh, and that they won't be able to get that again? That's, uh, while that's helpful to understand what your exposure has been, that doesn't necessarily demonstrate that you're going to have protection uh, against that. So really the only evidence right now, the, 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 the guidance that, that, that we're using right now is based on CDC's recommendations, that if you had a positive test in the last you know, three months or 90 days, then that is the only thing that will allow you an exception to the to the quarantine requirements. Great. So, Dr. Reeser, uh, we were asking the students to do a lot of things, uh, and this is this is a high threshold for you know kind of their expectations. 
Can you talk through what will happen if a student doesn't choose to follow that rules or maybe it's not them, but one of their housemates? Yeah, this is a really tough spot for our students and, um, and to help people understand the seriousness of this. We do have a COVID-19 incident report. So if there are any violations at all of the public health guidelines, um, a form can be completed anonymously and then we will be following up with all of those. So, um, but but it's, it is a tough spot. And, and it's, what if it's your roommate or your housemate or your best friend who's not doing this? Um, we're trying to um, give students the, the language and support that they need to, to hold each other accountable, to talk about the greater community, the greater good. But sadly, we know we have some students that are manipulating this system and trying really hard to um, not be tested or not follow the rules, and they're really putting everybody at risk. So we're taking that really, really seriously, both as a public health department and as a university. So again, as, as we indicated, if there are complaints, then the public health department could actually take action, whether that's fines or going to court. And certainly as a university, if students don't want to follow the rules and they're willing to take the risk, then they don't deserve to be here. And it's just not worth it. And so we do have an emergency suspension policy. Um, and, and I don't know how to emphasize how serious this is. Um, we're trying to do the best we can. We're trying to keep this university running in our hybrid way. We know that's what students want. And the reality is even if we went virtual, our students are still in town. They're still living here. And so again, following these guidelines are really, really important. So if there's a way for um, to have a meeting or just to talk about expectations, I mean, to me, this is what brotherhood and sisterhood is all about, right? This is about taking care of each other. This is about the greater good. This is about brotherhood and sisterhood in the whole community, in addition to their chapter and the whole community. This is what our students proclaim. It, it's what it means to live in a fraternity and sorority. These are their core values. Now they need to step up and show that. And I know that's easier said than done, um, but we have great students and I'm confident that they'll do that. And this is where we'll help them, right? We can help them with the language. We can help them hold accountable because at some point it's also not fair for them to have all this pressure. And we know there's a lot of pressure and stress and anxiety in, in this space right now, especially for our chapter presidents and the, and the leaders in the organization. So we're really, really sympathetic to this and trying to provide as much support as we can for our students. Uh, Kristen, as a follow-up to Dr. Reeser, um, you know, what I hear her saying is we, we don't blame anybody who gets sick. We don't blame anybody who finds himself in a quarantine, but once they are, uh, in that situation, we have some expectations of things we need them to do. We also know that there are some governing bodies that are over um, these individual chapters. Uh, what is the position that they're in? Uh, you know, if the house, uh, you know, doesn't follow its own procedures and rules, or what the campus is asking it to do, and you know, if a house closes, uh, is there things that happen for those chapter members? Yeah, um, currently the Panhellenic Council and the Interfraternity Council are working closely with CSO um, to make sure that we're holding uh, chapters accountable when um, uh, displaying poor behavior or not following both county guidelines and university expectations. And so uh, that can come at the IFC or Panhellenic level and it also can come at the institutional level. So um, as of right now, I would say that yes, Panhellenic IFC could potentially take disciplinary action if things are not fun are not followed, um, but nothing has currently taken took in place. And that will be a continued conversation that myself and Maggie have with both those councils on how to work directly with the university in the CSO process to hold um, the chapters accountable. Thanks. And I know we have great leadership and uh, we're not expecting this is going to be a thing, but it's good to you know put out there what it would look like. Uh, but we know our, our FSL leaders are, are strong and going to make the right choices. Mark, I do want to um, come back to you. You had mentioned earlier uh, that if a student gets sick and needs to miss a class, then they would reach out to their faculty member and let them know that. How much do they have to tell them about the situation they're in uh, in order to get that kind of accommodation? Uh, thank you, Argyle. Good clarification on this. Um, a student is not required to disclose their medical condition to their instructor. So uh, they simply need to contact the instructor and say they won't be able to be in class for whatever number of days. So um, there is no requirement to disclose their medical condition. So. Thanks for that clarification, Mark. Um, we do have a question that came in about uh, the, we do have some you know space set aside for isolation and 
Uh, there was a concern that came in, what if we that space fills up? Uh, the university does have capacity for additional spaces, uh, and we also are working uh, with off-campus vendors if it came to that. So we do have several other options for all, for other spaces if Zoe Bayless, where we're doing our isolation for Thurian Story Life community uh, fills up. We're not worried and concerned about that. Uh, so hopefully that will put that uh, concern at ease. Jake, uh, can I ask you this next question? Uh, could two COVID positive people isolate together? Sounds like people want to want to have a friend uh, around while they're going through this. Sure, and that's actually uh, a, a common practice uh, in some settings. Um, so if two people are tested positive, they don't necessarily represent a risk to each other. And so they could uh, uh, you know, work through that, that experience together. When they would clear, it could be very different from each other though. Good to know. Uh, Mark, uh, another question came in about, you know, if uh, a member has to break their lease, um, could you address what happens if a member has to break their lease uh, and will, how will those cover those costs be covered? Uh, sure. Um, this is a good time to uh, remind everybody that uh, the live-in facilities are privately owned and uh, the um, individual chapters have house corporations that uh, um, either own the building or lease the building and then um, charge, uh, pass those expenses on to the live-in members. Uh, for the year or two that they live in the facility. And so uh, the, none of that is coordinated centrally. And um, the, the student really needs to work with their house corporation about uh, rent forgiveness or some sort of uh, situation, if they can work that out with their individual house corporation. So. All right, well, we also know that there are concerns about how a person you know, handles this situation. Uh, financially, uh, if they find themselves in a position where uh, they have to break a lease or they have to, you know, incur additional expenses related to this situation. Lori, uh, Vice Chancellor Reese, are any, any thoughts about that, about how a student would navigate that with our on-campus resources? Yeah, it's really tough to ask students, um, especially those who have work um, responsibilities to quarantine and to forfeit that income for two weeks. So we appreciate the difficulty that that provides um, for some of our students. So I would encourage them to go to the financial aid office. Um, they may have some emergency um, resources, loan options or grant options um, that they might be able to help with. The Dean of Students Office also has some um, resources and options for to be able to help students in, in financial emergency situations as well. So again, there's there are good resources to help students in those difficult situations. And especially um, as Kristen alluded to, we're hoping the quarantine will only be for two weeks. But if, if one of those students tests positive within those two weeks, then the quarantine could actually go later. So we're really worried about just the span of what this could look like um, for our students. But all those offices are available to, um, are open for virtual. So again, students should not have to leave and we don't want them to leave um, the, the chapter house at all. So they can reach out to either the Dean of Students Office or financial aid um, for, for support and questions about any financial um, assistance that they might need. Another great online resource is the Get Help tab on the students.wis.edu site. So if you would uh, look at that, there are some additional financial resources. That's Get Help tab on the students.wisc.edu website. Jake, coming back to you, could a fraternity sorority house become an isolation space? So that would essentially require that everybody in there already be tested positive. Um, so it, that that's really an unlikely event and not something that I could see uh, uh, happening. I mean, it, it would require that everybody be positive that, that's in that space. So that's why we've worked so hard to try to figure out other solutions that you've heard about. I also just like to comment that those who are quarantined, uh, one of the nice things about living in a chapter house and, you, and going through quarantine as difficult as that is, is at least you do have the connection and the, the ability to interact with others as long as you maintain those physical distancing and face coverings. Others on campus who don't have that kind of living arrangement might have to quarantine and, and really in, <laughs> alone. And that's not a real uh, easy experience to work through. So I really appreciate that the communities that you create for your students uh, um, and those chapters, you know, provides that level of support for each other. But it's vital that everybody follow those guidelines 
that you've been shared with. But um, so go back to the question, isolating uh, in within the fraternity or sorority chapters seems very unlikely, and that'll be dependent upon public health guidelines, but uh, that's not something that I would plan for. Jake, uh, let's stick with you for just a second. Can you talk about the medical care a member would receive if they get sick? Uh, and what's the guidance for, you know, going to the hospital? How would they even get to the hospital um, in that situation? Sure. So, um, first of all, in most cases, individuals will have, you know, relatively uh, manageable symptoms and can and can successfully, you know, go through the isolation period, um, uh, you know, without much difficulty. However, there's a daily check-in from University Health Services, both electronically uh, as uh, in terms of checking uh, about symptoms and developments, if students don't respond to that within a certain time frame each day, then somebody will actually will follow up with them. And if they start to see um, uh, the symptoms that are, are, are developing, becoming more serious, it will work with them about coordinating additional care. Of course, if, if a medical emergency were to develop, they would be transported, you know, like any other medical emergency to the local hospital. We have a physician whose job really is to focus on providing oversight for all of this uh, uh, individuals in, in isolation. So um, we've got a, a robust system in place to support that. All right, so I just want to note that we're 37 minutes in. We have a lot of people online and a lot of questions from you. We love that, and we're glad that this is actually providing a service to you. So thanks for being online. Uh, Dr. Reeser, if I could ask you this question. With this latest uh, guidance from Public Health Madison-Dame County that some live-in members uh, that are, would not be required to be quarantined if they have a positive test over the last 90 days, there's some worry out there about the perception that those people might be in violation. How would they navigate that? What's your advice for that situation, knowing that that's a unique situation for those individuals? Yeah, that's really in that tricky space of, of accountability and, um, and people, again, kind of a lot of people are just watching. And, and so I would give the example that of what we've had in, a, in other circumstances before this, because I think the same thing applies. The, the public health department has de defined all of the chapters as households. And so for some of these organizations, they can have 50 members. Let's just say there's 50 men and living in one of the fraternities. They can be together. They can interact with each other. They can, um, they're not restricted to the 10 and 25, 10 in-person event. Um, 25 outside event. So you could have 50 men outside playing um, Frisbee or something, and they're still following the public health guidelines. The perception on the outside is that they're not and that they're having a party or that they're engaging with lots of people. So we're getting all those pictures. We're getting those complaints. We're taking them very seriously. We're looking at them closely. We are following up with chapters to make sure that what is happening and what is um, and whether it, guidelines are being followed. So apply that to the quarantine piece. We could get a picture of a young woman walking into walking out of a sorority house, and we could get that picture. We probably would follow up with that chapter to say, "Hey, we have this picture. Is this a member who is who is supposed to be under quarantine or not?" And if the answer is no, she's not under quarantine, then we're then we're fine. Then we're fine. So I, I don't want to discount the perception of that, but we're we are taking all of the complaints seriously. But we also know that there are two sides to every story, at least. We're following up, we're asking for information. So we're not leaping to a conclusion necessarily without doing our own due diligence. So I'm sensitive to the perception. And unfortunately, this is this is a challenge, honestly, about with these large organizations all together, um, and because of some of the national press that's out there, there 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 are some targets, and there are people that are actually watching um, and trying to um, get folks in trouble. But we're taking it seriously and understanding um, that there are valid reasons for some of these activities to be happening. So, Dr. Reeser, what I hear you saying is, you know, they students should focus on what they are supposed to do. They they know if they're in compliance or not. Uh, and that's what you want them to keep their focus on and not, you know, while we need to be cognizant of others that are out there, that's how they can address this uh, in the, the most positive way. Yep. Well said, Arga. Well said. And I know that we know that's stressful and hard, but at some point you just, you all have to just focus and do the right thing. Know you're doing the right thing and know that we, we've got your back if you're doing the right thing. We'll take care of that. Great. 
Mark, uh, we have on-campus housing and we have then chapter houses and apartments off campus. Can you talk a little bit about how the residence halls on campus and the fraternity story life chapters are being handled either similarly or differently? Uh, sure. So uh, in lots of ways, they're being handled uh, in a similar format and similar fashion. So both uh, the residence halls and the chapter facilities are pursuing this uh, isolation space uh, separately from uh, quarantine space. Uh, so that's the same. We're both using the same uh, cleaning contractors, the same um, laundry services uh, to provide those services um, and using the same criteria uh, to make these decisions. Uh, where there's a difference, it's in the uh, meal or food program uh, in housing. Uh, the students have already um, paid for that. And so housing is making um, one trip a day to each um, um, residence or um, room uh, to provide meal service. Uh, and why we can't do that uh, as seamlessly in FSL is because of the, again, the independence of the house corporations for each of these chapters. So we have made it clear to the house corporation boards and advisors that if they need assistance in providing basic services, uh, the university through its uh, other um, programs, such as the union that has food dining service, we're willing to work with them to help make sure that people are fed. But the house corporation boards are making independent decisions about their meal programs and how they will extend those to the isolation space. But uh, we're, we certainly do not want people to be hungry and not have the food service that they need. So we've made it clear that we'll help make that happen if a house corporation board needs that assistance. So. All right, thanks, Mark. Jake, a question has come in about uh, students and testing. Uh, the students just tested uh, negative a couple days ago, bless you. Do they need to uh, test again? And then we also know that there's some special testing set up on Tuesday in the Fluno Center. So maybe you could kind of answer that uh, as you answer this other question. Jake, I think you're muted. Hello. Oh, yes, you're good. Now? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll get that mute figured out. Um, so so individuals who tested in uh, you know today or even a couple of days ago, um, does does not mean that that they've not been exposed since those test results come back, and so you know that that wouldn't be useful in terms of you know uh, managing the situation differently going forward. So um, so that's that's really why we went ahead and set up the testing plan for Tuesday with the Fluno, and we made sure that there's plenty of capacity there for the for the chapters we've already identified to go ahead and get tested there, and then we made arrangements uh, in a dedicated way to be sure that the rest of the uh, of the of the chapters um, live in members can also get tested you know before the end of the week so everybody has a good understanding where they're at and then the, that they can make any adjustments to their their practices and protocols and so forth that that they need to put in place okay Jake a uh, little time for a little myth busting here uh, there's a perception out there that students should just go ahead go out, get COVID, so they only have to isolate for 10 days. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I certainly understand the temptation, um, to, to, but there's a lot of risk associated with that. There is no certainty about how long any antibodies might actually persist. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot of varying opinions about that, uh, uh, that, that make that a, a risky behavior. And what's even more important, and particularly in these settings, is the, the individuals that you're around. Um, you don't know uh, how how this might affect them, what their particular health risk might be. And it's it's not clear that everybody reacts the same way to the condition. So um, it's just it's a dangerous practice, not only for yourself, but it's also dangerous for those that you're around. So um, that is a really a, 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 an ineffective and dangerous strategy. So so don't do that, please. Great. I know I was on campus late last night and uh, by and large, we saw a great behavior from our students. And so that's exactly what we need to see is people taking this seriously uh, and you know doing the right thing. Um, Lori or Dr. Reese, I know you maybe had another thought about this uh, question. You're good, okay. Um, Kristen, then let's jump back to you. Uh, we haven't heard your voice in a couple minutes. So how would you talk about recommendations given by public health and how the impact on chapters, what are they doing to set up uh, their situation and what have you heard from them? Yeah, that's a great question. We recognize that each of our facilities is set up differently that you all inhabit. And so some have meal plans and certain things given to them while living in, while others may have an apartment style living where they're in charge of their own meal plans, their food. And then also knowing that each space just looks very different. It might be inhabited by folks who are not affiliated, whatever reason. 
Um, and so we know there are very different circumstances for each chapter. And so what we are hoping to do, like Mark said earlier, is really support you on a case case by case basis if you need that support for meals or recommendations on how to get things delivered all those other things that come into that live in residential experience to really help support you all through this time while i can't answer all questions right now on like how does this impact me in this facility we can meet and discuss on how does this going to affect each chapter if you need that extra support and if you have support through a chapter advisor or local housing board or even your national headquarters reach out to them. They'll be able to really provide that direct support for your individual chapter experience. And if you can't get into contact with those folks or don't have that contact, we are here to support you in figuring out how to support all the members as we live through this quarantine and isolation space. So Kristen, what I hear you saying is it's kind of a networked web of support here. I mean, the fact that these are facilities not owned by the campus uh, means there are other uh, you know, entities out there that they need to be working with, but the campus is here as you and Maggie Hayes being part of the campus staff to help also try to fill in gaps and figure out when there's maybe not clarity, how somebody can get some help. So I think it's important for people on line here to hear today that like, we're here for you. We want this to work out, but we also know there's some things that you'll need to turn to for to other people. Um, there is a follow-up question that came in about quarantine. I think it's kind of important to try to uh, put out there uh, the students that are in quarantine are asking, do they have to actually stay in the, their bedroom, the room that they live in, or can they go to other spaces in the house? Is there a possibility of setting up a common space in the house for studying and things like that? Uh, Jake, I think this, maybe we'll start with you and see if others have thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Argyle. Uh, yeah, so the, what's really important while you're in quarantine is, first of all, the only time that you shouldn't be wearing a face covering is when you're in a room all by yourself, like your, your individual private bedroom. But if you're around anybody else in a common space, you need to maintain that physical distancing, a minimum of six feet, and you need to be wearing a face covering. It's also important that you continue to wash your hands uh, and, and, and clean your spaces on a regular basis. You can't do that too frequently. So while you can be around others, you have to abide by those, those guidelines. Otherwise, you run a real risk of extending the quarantine period uh, beyond uh, the absolute minimum. So um, yes, that's the nice thing about living in one of these settings that you can be around other folks, but you have to follow those guidelines. Otherwise it'll take much longer. All right, um, we do have the isolation space set aside for the parents for life students, but that does come uh, at a charge. Mark, could you talk a little bit about what that is and uh, why that is so? Um, sure. Uh, the um, space at uh, Zoe Bayless uh, right now it comes at a cost of $64 a night. Um, and those uh, fees are being charged back to the house corporations, uh, not to the individualized students from, as far as the university is concerned. Um, then the house corporation can make a decision how to spread that cost among the chapter or to um, pass that fee on to the individual student. That's really up to them. Um, so we're not, the university is not charging the students, um, much like we're not charging the students in housing. Um, they, so uh, we are trying to be consistent there, so. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, Kristen, I think it's important for us to talk about recruitment. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, have you talk a little bit about how this situation impacts recruitment and Mark, feel free to uh, you know pitch in here if you have some other thoughts. Yeah, it's a great question. I know before all this, that was definitely on the forefront of many of our students' minds while they welcome in new members this coming fall. Um, we um, recognize it's going to take a serious impact on recruitment activities, um, and this has been moving so quickly over the past couple of days that we have not fully been able to dive in on how does what does this mean for the recruitment process. But we are hearing the concerns of this is not a priority of mine currently, and so we really want to make sure that we bring each of the councils together, talk through ex plans or dates, and what makes sense for everyone. So our hope is. Um, to have a decision on all recruitment activities um, in the next coming um, week, um, so sooner than later. Um, and additionally, I think to continue is we've already been encouraging all virtual events anyways. So if we do need, as we move forward, if dates do get pushed back or whatnot, we'll be able to support the community's recruitment efforts, um, no matter the time frame and what we all do. So look out for an answer closer to next week. I, I just follow up to say, um, We've actually received um, input from the students themselves and the chapters that 
they are not wanting to focus on recruitment right now. They have too much else to worry about. So it's actually coming from the student leaders themselves, which is a really positive sign. So. Jake, I think this question was already addressed a little earlier in some of your comments, but it's come up again. So I just want to bring it back up. Um, is it okay to isolate in a hotel? It, yeah, the, it, I mean, technically it, it is okay to do that as so long as you can s literally stay away from anybody else and you can have food arranged for you. But that's a very difficult thing to do. So I, I just, I really think that the best thing for folks to do is to follow the, 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 the plan that's been developed and that they can isolate in the, in the residence spaces that have been identified where we know that there's adequate support to, for them at, to navigate that successfully. The alternative to that is, is not a good situation. And is it true that uh, the standards for isolation don't change based on where you do it? If the hotel, Zoe Bayless, I mean, it's the same regardless in terms of what the students expected to do. Absolutely. The isolation requirements are, are very strict, and uh, that's why we've worked hard to make sure that we can provide a place to support students in that. Hotels are not set up to do that. Um, they just simply aren't. And frankly, they probably wouldn't really like people to be there in that situation. Okay. You know, this is obviously stressful for, for the students, uh, especially students who are sick, students who are the ones having a quarantine. Uh, can you talk to us, Jake, and others about mental health uh, what people can do to help support themselves or other people. Jake, maybe we'll start with you and see if others have thoughts on this. Sure. Thank you, uh, Argyle. Th this is a particularly difficult time anyway. Um, and, and so then to also go through an experience where you have to isolate or quarantine just really piles on the, the stress. So um, I, I want you to know that we have a, a strong and fully staffed uh, mental health uh, program here at UHS. They have been working uh, really since early last spring and have become very, very effective at providing uh, remote uh, video uh, mental health services. Our staff are trained to do that. It's worked very, very successfully. So we can, uh, we're, we're ready to help support any, anybody that finds themselves in, in need of that. So those could be routine, regular appointments if you've already been under care, but if you, if you develop a, a need while you're there, we have the capacity to help support someone uh, during that period of time. So all the same level of care and and uh, and support that, that you would otherwise expect are available to you. And if there's a crisis, we're prepared to help support you with that as well. Any other thoughts from panelists about how to get through this? Sure, Dr. Reeser. Yeah, I, d I just would add, um, I think if there is a specific need that a chapter is just really experiencing stress or anxiety, then, then doing group um, work is also an option as well. And so again, it may be, there's, there's lots of different uh, mental health support that can be provided. It could be just for an individual who wants to have a counseling appointment, but maybe, you know, stress and anxiety and tensions are just high and they just need somebody to kind of help calm that down. We can provide support for chapters in that basis. So either again, a chapter president could reach out to MHS or they could reach out to Kristen or Maggie or any of us here on this call and we will do what we can to provide some additional special support for the for students living in that. Because again, we're really worried and concerned about the extra stress and anxiety. We know that's high for our college students and this is just making it even more difficult for many of them. Uh, Jake, it's uh, been asked again about the thresholds for a house having to quarantine or close. Um, what is that threshold where that moves a house into that different status? Yeah, so um, the technical definition from CDC, which the public health department is following, which has informed their decisions, is that when you live in a congregate living center, such as a chapter house, that literally one positive case or more um, uh, it would, would cause a quarantine order, would support the need to quarantine the, 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 the individuals in that space. Um, that said, we also know that if you have one, it's very likely you have others, which is why the testing that, we're, that we've uh, uh, mandated for individuals in those living settings uh, is important to, to go ahead and do so that we can identify those others who likely are positive, but just don't realize that. And so we want to support them um, uh, as quickly as possible as well. Um, I know that some people joined us, you know, as we've been speaking through this. So I just want to jump back to, I think one point that's really important. So people all kind of leave this webinar understanding uh, the same thing. So Jake, I'm coming back to you again about quarantine. So mm -hmm. if you could kind of go over again, what is quarantine? What can they do? How long might it last? Um, sure. uh, you know, and really uh, just bring that point home one more time. 
Right. Thank you. Um, we we want to reinforce that. You know, the the individuals who've been notified of quarantine were given some very specific guidelines about what what is expected of them. Um, so quarantine is is for somebody who has likely been exposed to a positive case. They're considered a close contact, um, and that there is a there's a there's a likelihood that they could develop um, uh, COVID um, uh, during during it, without necessarily realizing that they've been exposed. Um, and so the, the quarantine period is at a minimum going to last 14 days. So if everybody does what they're supposed to do and no new positive cases develop, um, the quarantine period uh, should conclude around 14 days. Um, but if somebody develops a positive case, develops symptoms during that period of time, um, uh, it may be necessary to extend that quarantine period uh, uh, for an additional period of time. So. Um, it, that's why it's so important that everybody do what they need to do. I mean, it could go 28 days if if something happens towards the end of that 14 day period. Um, but again, if everybody follows the protocols and, 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 and accomplish what they need to do, it can be as short as 14 days. But we just want you to be prepared. It could go longer. So thanks, Jake. Some of our students are asking, you know, in terms of their mental health exercise is a good uh, thing for that. Right. And so they're if they're isolated in their chapter house. Uh, can they exercise outside? What's how would you guide them on that? You know, so they can actually get some physical activity in. Yeah, that that's a great question, and uh, actually, they they need to stay within their residence to to be compliant with the direction um, of the orders. I would ask them to look at what uh, the virtual experience uh, services that uh, that the recreational well being program actually has uh, offered. There are some online options available to help, you know, kind of motivate and guide people through different uh, individual workout exercises. But so, uh, yeah, staying active is really, really important to all of our health and well being. Um, that's just particularly challenging this situation. All right. I think we're close on time. So, Jake, any any closing comments? Yeah, I just uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate people taking time to try to understand what's going on and why it's important. Um, and I just want to reinforce uh, that this is really about trying to uh, uh, get ahead of a problem before it becomes more serious and more widespread. Uh, our, our, our bottom line interest is supporting the health and well-being of, of our entire campus community. And in this setting, we have an opportunity to make a difference and, 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 and get ahead of this. So um, following these protocols, following these guidelines is, is essential. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence that we will be able to do that. The students are committed to, to following through as, as they need to do. And uh, I just appreciate your support for, for your students uh, during this period of time as well. And if you need additional help through health and well-being, you know, we certainly are committed to providing that support as well. Mark, how about you? Any parting thoughts? Well, I just want to remind everybody how important the Fraternity and Story Life community at UW-Madison is to us. Uh, and one of the unique things about this off-campus um, housing situation is that it's led by students and student leadership is something that uh, we uh, put a lot of time and energy into, even in the most trying of times. And so um, our uh, connection with the student leaders in each of these chapters has been extremely strong this summer. Uh, and we are here to support them through this process. Uh, our, our two goals are the uh, safety of the students and the ability to have a productive academic experience. And uh, those are the, we're gonna work on just those two things the rest of the semester. So if um, we can continue the great partnership we've had so far with the student leaders and the house corporations and the advisors, I think we can get there. All right, Dr. Reese, closing thoughts from you. Yeah, thank you um, for joining us this morning. Wish it were certainly for um, different circumstances. I just want to highlight a couple of things. One, it's really important for everybody to know, being having our students be at UW Madison, all the work and the research and the the uh, extremely talented and smart faculty and researchers that are guiding these directions and these in, these um, progress is really significant. So we're so lucky to have. Um, tons and tons of people working on our protocols, working on our plans, working on our decision making. And the team meets every single day, looking at it all, what's happening nationally. And if things change, 
um, based on testing, based on guidelines, then we're going to make those changes as well. And so we're really trying to stay on top of all of this and do what's on the cutting edge of research and what's in best practice. So the Smart Restart website is a great resource to find current information. This week we added a dashboard. And so that's, again, we're trying to be as transparent as possible about our numbers our numbers both on the on the campus as well as our if students are tested here at uw or if students are being tested in the community so that people know um, what the impact of that is and then as we get those data that's where we're trying to make decisions that's where we're trying to make data driven decisions and that's why the actions are being taken right now with fraternities and sororities because we have data that shows that our students are at risk we have data that show that cases are growing and are happening in these chapters and we're trying to get on top of them as quickly as possible to contain this virus. We are doing that same approach for every place on campus. We're doing it in the residence halls. We will do it in academic buildings. It, this is our goal is to be really data centered. And if we see, see concerns, then we wanna target those areas, address those areas and see if we can contain that virus and then hopefully um, continue to decrease the number of positive cases as opposed to increasing. The other last thing that I would just say is it was really to echo Mark's um, comments. We know the stigma is high um, fraternities and sororities. We know that, um, again, nationally, they've been targeted um, for, for um, being the cause and the reason for some institutions shutting down. And again, there's some legitimacy to that. There are parties that are happening across the country. We've had some of those situations happen here as well. We've had heard stories and have seen evidence where some people are not following the public health guidelines. At the same time, that's not all of our students. And we know that the members in fraternity and sorority life are doing the right thing. And we know that we have great leadership in our students from the chapter presidents to IFC and Panhellenic. They came out really quickly and strong. No part, no social events with alcohol. That was their statement. They did that on their own. And I think what we also need these chapters to do is to tell the story of the other good things that they're doing. And we want to continue to work on that with them so that they know, the community knows, the city of Madison knows, the university knows that um, the fraternities and sororities bring a lot of benefit um, and their values of, of academics, philanthropy and brotherhood and sisterhood are really important. And those are positive contributions to our institutions. So we stand behind them to help them and to continue to tell that story and to keep them safe. All right, I think with that, we are at time. I wanna thank everyone for attending today's web chat. Students, we know you are taking your, your safety seriously. Parents, we know it's hard for you to send your student away from home anytime, but particularly this year. We want everyone to know that we are taking this very seriously. A couple quick reminders, uh, as Dr. Reeser said, the Smart Start recent website has a dashboard. You can get that from a link off the homepage of uh, WIS.edu. Uh, it has the dashboard she mentioned. It has a health and screening tool and many other resources there. I also want to remind you that University Health Services offers telehealth and telemedicine. You can get those appointments by calling 608-265-5600 or go to your MyUHS account at uhs.wis.edu. Um, we also have uh, facts up on the FSL website, so the Fraternity Story Life website. There are uh, things up there that you can read that are specific to this issue. And then you can also email the advisor at greeklife.wis.edu for questions. Um, we have recorded this session, uh, so it will be available on this channel uh, if you'd like to watch it again or maybe send a link to someone else who couldn't join us today. Uh, so please, uh, we really want you to stay safe, uh, stay in touch, and we promise to do the same. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.